and my film was Dance. I uh, wrote, directed and produced the film. I uh, make short films about um, inclusion and equality <coughs> and forgotten people, really. Then keep the mic there. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask the questions of each person one by one. I do want to get to Q&A from you guys, but I'm just gonna do a couple of quick questions at the beginning. So tell me about this film in particular and where it came from a lot of heart. So yeah, yeah, what's, yeah. What's the, what's the starting point for that? Um, my aunt went into a, a care home due to COVID. She um, has dementia and my uncle had been looking after her and then was no longer able to look after her. And it was what he saw from the other side of the glass that a lot of care home workers were either exhausted or not interested and those that were interested perhaps were not given the chance to give the care that they wanted to give. And I felt that a lot of assumptions are made about people who are in care homes or in hospices, I'm a hospice patient, um, that actually they no longer belong in the world or they can't engage. And if the person out there gives the right kind of interaction or just caring and love, actually there's always somebody in there and there's always life to lead. Is the starting point for your films, for, for your filmmaking, then your viewpoint, or did, were you a filmmaker before? And how, does, how did this come about as a means of expression? Um, no, I was, I was a psychologist actually for the NHS for 18 years. So I've observed people for all of my working life, but I've always been a writer, um, mainly of scripts and uh, short stories. And I was commissioned to uh, write a play for the LGBT History Month which got filmed, but I wasn't happy with the way it was filmed. So I decided to write more scripts and then film them myself. It's got, it's got so much heart and, you know, it just it draws you in because of that. The guy is superb as well. Uh, uh, well how did you Paul Cummings that? is absolutely amazing. Um, the reason why, I, another reason why I wrote that was, um, my wife and I go to home in Manchester um, to view a film, have a meal, that's all I'm up to these days. And the first time we went, which was probably about three years ago or so, and went for a meal, there was this gorgeous guy who he danced along to the music and then took your order and then danced away. <laughs> and we got chatting to him. And he was a very caring guy. He immediately came up to me and said, are you in pain? Are you okay? And we got chatting. And out of that just came these, I suppose, amalgamation of the story about people in care homes but also this amazing guy Paul Cummings who he really cared and, and music was his life he actually was in um, a dance band called was it uh, the, jazz defectors. the Jazz Defectors so he was uh, a singer and dancer he was a backing uh, singer for Sade so he had an amazing history and I just said I'm gonna write a film for you to be in so that was where that came from so he's a performer, as a dancer, he's not really an actor. In, in, yeah, yeah, he has an equity card, he's been in films, he does. Okay. He's been in films with Richard Lee, uh, Christopher Lee rather, as um, usually horror films, <laughs> a long time ago. Right. I'm really glad I asked you that because that was a great answer that it came, again it came from heart, the yeah. side of where you found him in casting. Yeah, he's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. I'm going to pass over that mic, pass over to Jay. I'm going to come back to everybody for questions. Jason. Yeah. Tell me about your film. Where did it come from? Um, there's a lot of heart again. There's a, it's a, it's a strong viewpoint going on here. Yeah, uh, well, I'm mixed race, and uh, I've noticed, I remember like some things that happened in the 70s when people were coming around campaigning, and I saw a kind of a rise in the right in the UK, and I wanted to just examine what would it be like if you were a mixed race racist yeah. uh, and then you would kind of go so it's about a bloke who converts to islam inside and then it's his welcome home party when he was yeah. part of the edl so i just wanted to you know, explore that and also the impact that it would have on people around him, particularly this father-daughter relationship so it's about a bit it's kind of a wider idea really it's, it wasn't really meant to be a short we thought we, we, we imagined it being a feature but to get interest and money to write the feature script, we know that we had to make the short. It's kind of like oh, a proof it's a, of it's a proof of concept. Proof of concept, yeah. I think, yeah. You know. How's that going? 
Well, it's early days. It's just got out. It's now, just out. Yeah. yeah, it's just finished, and yeah. so we're just now waiting to see how people respond to it. It's. I don't think it's an easy watch. I would just want it to kind of create a little bit of tension and, and stuff. Yeah, like it's it's intense and painful to watch, but um, superb actors. Once again, you've got great faces and great voices. Yeah, so um, Luc de Jean, who plays the lead, he yeah. was uh, in <coughs> London's Burning years ago, and he approached myself and Hannah, the producer, and said that he had some money and he wanted to get back into acting, and so it started like that, really. Okay. And so for a while, we were like, well, what are we going to do, what are we going to do, and eventually uh, he put some money in, and I said, okay, we'll go and make a short. So we shot it three days, and I can't remember where we shot it, actually. It was down south. It says yeah. on the credits, that's yeah. all I know. I don't really can recognize it. Well, it's quite funny because I said, whenever I hear a racist voice, I heard like this London thing, and he said, oh, I heard Burnham Manning. So I think that's what happens in the North South Divide. We all think it's a significant other, it's the racist. You, you think know. of Millwall. Yeah, um, but you know, and I think. I'm glad it wasn't Leeds as yeah. well. So. Which is pretty contemporary now, isn't it? Weirdly, it's quite, it's how quick things can change. And we had a response from some people who said, oh, it's not the right climate for a film like this. We're looking for something quite bright and fluffy coming out of COVID. But now with what's happened in Italy, I think that it might be the right time for a film like this. So. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Yeah, really the best of luck with it. It's really <coughs> impressive, beautiful production values. Yeah, yeah really nicely put together. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, tell me about yourself. I'm Kia. Uh, I did Men Only. Men Only. And where did that come from? Men Only. The, the deepest recesses. Um, <laughs> now I'm just always trying to do stuff that is different and surprising. And uh, certainly trying to look at any kind of subject matter that could be approached in a, in, in a different way. It was. I mean, I at the beginning I thought, oh my god, I don't understand this film. Mm -hmm. and it was alienating. You know, at the beginning I thought, I don't know if I'm going to be able to ask. But then it all landed. You know, the, what, what's going on? Sure. And I got it. Uh, and it what it, it was a twist, and it was really it really held me because I didn't know what was going on and what was happening. Sure. And it was quite a striking striking images. What did you shoot on? It had a sort of low res. A five D. On a five D, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, she once again she was great. The actress, the the lead, she was very. Mm. It was quite a special performance. Yeah, with charm and oh, violence and everything. And yeah, was she was she was the lead in, in the last film. Okay, what language was it? Uh, Hungarian. Hungarian, right? I didn't recognise it yeah. at all. That's why, because it's outside the Indo-European tradition. That's mm -hmm. that's my excuse. <laughs> okay, um, and uh, have, is it is it? Um, your first festival with this? Or is it just no, done or no, have no. you been a... Oh, sorry, yes, it is. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, yeah. Just yeah. launched? Yes. Premier? Just launched. Premier, yeah. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. We were a nice crowd for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> lovely. Okay, anything else you want to tell us about it that was really uh, special in the production? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it costs nothing. So, you know, I'm if, if, if in any way I managed to exceed that limitation, then, you know, you did. It's a very strong narrative that really holds you because of the angular way that it starts and it all comes together mm -hmm. at the end. It's very, and it has a lovely tenderness when you know when those those. Sure. Yeah, there, I, I was trying really, to trying to mix the the tones and, and uh, you know. it all comes together. Really yeah. well done. Really well done. Thank you. Nice work. Cheers, for that. Let's go next. There you go. Cheers. I'm Steve. I did Burma. Burma. Right. Um, and do you want to say just something before we begin? Okay. Um, it was based on, um, well, at the end of lockdown three, I ran out of hash and I started having some very vivid dreams. And um, that was one of them. Um, that was the only one that was kind of filmic. So um, I, I was doing a couple of films anyway, so I just got developed that and um, made it this year. Did you, um, did it come also from Dario Argento, to some extent? 
Oh Jesus. gosh, no. Um, I was aiming for David Lynch. It kind of, it kind of came out Cronenberg, but thank you for the Dario Argento. I'll take oh, that. For me, I had a lot of Argento about it, not just in the very striking visuals and the lurid effect, but also the, you ADR'd all the dialogue in that in that Italian yes, style. Yes, did. Was that on purpose? Definitely. Was it just bad definitely. Well, sound or what? Um, my friend Laurie, who um, does all my sound design, is. Um, it's absolutely amazing. It's I, I wouldn't record well, wouldn't record sound on a film while I was shooting. Never. Right, but you just never do, and that's your style. To... It's 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 the only way to do it. The, uh, the sound design was uh, amazing. It it does have a big part of the impact because it well for me it relates to Dario Argento, those Argento films, and that whole Italian horror tradition. Yeah. That, well, thank you very much. You are thank in. you, Laurie. Yeah. It's a, Really striking imagery, uh, Thank you. locations, makeup. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot going on. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, um, it's well, well, like I said, it's quite quite surreal. I mean, you know, it's the only film I've ever made where I'm trying to tap into my unconscious, or, or well, it's my unconscious, subconscious, whatever. Your hash addled, your lack of yeah, hash addled, COVID, yeah. late COVID. Maybe I should run out of hash more. <laughs> <laughs> well, do it, do it when you need inspiration. You need inspiration. It's, a, it's definitely a working thing. I don't, I don't know, maybe I, I should promise you a lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Paul Chambers and I uh, directed in uh, Pleasant Cruiser. Oh, uh, yeah, right. So we're going right back to the beginning now. Um, uh, I know that, that that's the pub on the way to Sailor Canal, isn't it, with the pizza place? Yeah, it's on the yeah, yeah, bridge Canal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, bridge water, yeah. yeah, 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 good location. Um, so where did this come from, these two guys? Are they, like, figments for each other, or, like, yeah, doppelgangers they, or something? They were influenced by these two separate men that I met whilst, because I, I used to live in Sailor, I live in Levenshire now, but I used to walk along that canal and cycle along it every day. And I met these two men just separately who both would say filled their whole life for a canal boat and then um, for multiple different reasons uh, their partners had left them just before they retired and so they had this boat with nowhere to go and not the confidence to go alone and um, I just thought it was interesting that there's these two men that were on the same stretch of canal within touching distance and they didn't know each other and they had exactly the same story so I kind of brought them into one story and kind of play them off each other as if they are both parts of the same person, you know, like one lacks what the other has and vice versa. So more like Bergman, right? Persona, right? <laughs> yeah, two people I don't know. Really. House. That's yeah. the that's <laughs> remind me of that. Yeah. There's the two people, one is changing into the other in a in house uh, across the course of the film, Persona. They're switching Persona. Yeah, they're kind of, yeah. It reminded me of that mm. because there really, really was that unraveling, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, again, really good casting. Everybody had really good cast. Both I, of the I, actors are there really, today, actually. Are they? Um, congratulations, Sam, to you. Because I, I, they, throughout these films, I, seeing the faces, I said to myself, "You are. You really, really went at it. You know what I mean? To get the cast, get casts mm. with, you know, strong voices and look like that. That goes for all the films. I thought. I thought it was really strong. Yeah. Part part of the idea well, it was just a bit fun, really. But part of the idea was to kind of give a give like create roles for like older actors that aren't like the granddad you know give them physical roles that require oh, like really commitment good. and and like you know like uh, t you know lack of morals like doing things that you don't usually see older people play you know the roles in um, and then all the supporting cast we uh, cast from the elders uh, theater company so they're all kind of uh, like an open casting um, and then we also did some casting sessions with a uh, homeless um, acting group as well. All right, I'd like to get the details of those from you. I don't know about those. And I, I, I was just even the tiny parts, yeah, across the canal were really nicely cast. Yeah, the really outstanding uh, part of the film. Really, um, I don't want to waste any more time with me asking questions. By the way, I will be here uh, for the long haul. Uh, we're going to go to the dockyard, the bar across the way afterwards. So, um, if anybody wants to ask me about my... No, we're going to ask you about your film now. Oh, are you? Like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's got it like, we'll sorry. flip it and... Okay, okay. And I'll interview you on your film. So, I do. You know. So, obviously, the only documentary 
in in the groups in the in the films that we showed. So tell us about how the film came about, and it's obviously a passion project as well, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So in the film, I say that I heard the song when I was a kid, and I always wondered what what was that song, about? what was that sound that I heard in the song. And then I was in a bookshop one day, and I saw this book, The Handling of David Olawali, and I I saw the name, and I thought that sounds like. And I swear this is what happened. I looked at it, and said. That, that sounds like the name in that song, that sound in that song. And I picked it up, and sure enough it was. And I bought it and read it right away. And I thought it would make, that would make a, re a really good drama. You know, like Red Riding, Line of Duty, you know, you could be a TV, TV drama. Or a documentary with reconstructions or whatever. But it didn't occur to me to make a film like that. And then I, I got a job filming Inside Army Jail. Um, and I went back to Leeds to wreck it wandered through my old street. And you know yourself, a place that you grew up or a place that you know well from the past, when you go, you have all the memories come at you. And for me, just on this trip to Leeds, I just saw a Wally Wally when I went. I was sort of haunted by his presence, because I went to the, that street in the original Oak, and I went, to, I was, he was inside army jail many times, and all of the places were his places, as it happened. And so I really was, thought about him a lot as well as, you know, that's the bench over there we had that time mm -hmm. when I was in that pub. And he did all those memories from my youth. And um, not on that day, but a few days later, I just went, that's the film I should make about memories in the city and how it all affected me. And, and so I put myself in it and I knew that that way I could make it with archive yeah. and shooting a bit and just talking about the place. And you don't, because there is no footage of him. Well, I always think with films, you have to have a good central theme. With documentary, it's slightly different. You have to ask the audience a question, a central question. Is there a central question you think that you had at the heart of the film? Um, and I know that kind of like, and why were you weaving football and this together? I mean, I know yeah. the chanting does that. So the chant is my starting point with it. And I, I that brings in the, the team that that comes from, and I am a fan. Um, but it also, I used Leeds United as a metaphor, the, the club for the si actual city, because, uh, you know, Leeds were a very early adopter of it, you know, to have a, a black player when he played in 1961 for Leeds. You know, he was playing against 11 white men every single week, right? There was, you know, nobody else in the league at that time. Uh, there might have been one other, actually, but, I, you know, it was, it, was, it was very unusual. And that idea that the club reflects the city and is inclusive. Um, also, because we're all familiar with the idea of football having a very, a very strong connection to the story of racism, right? Which you touched on in your film, right? The, the, the football and yeah. football and racism, you know, taking the knee. It's always been very a very dynamic relationship. The FA has now taken a really strong lead on this, but for a long time. You know, football was a place where you could go to congregate with racists if that was your bent, right? It was, a, it was a not not a happy story, not a happy relationship for me. That was yeah, where well, I definitely. Was I mean, no, look, there is connections, no doubt about it, between yeah. the two two films and the message of it. But so. Yeah, yeah, and I, I really loved your use of archive for mm. footage, the especially the police. I noticed that the. Chief Constable, who's in charge of the Yorkshire River case, was actually featured in your. I didn't notice that. Uh -huh. I didn't notice that. I'm from that. Yorkshire as well. You he's see, another, he was the one that was listening to the tapes and saying, "We've definitely got, we've definitely got this one on the tape." So the Chief Constable is there, and, and he was um, a, a well-known figure as well. So I was really interested to see that there. That's right. This is this is Olwell is not the most shameful part of the uh, policing of West Yorkshire. It is definitely <laughs> yeah. definitely the Yorkshire Ripper. I mean, they they just would not listen to the women who've been attacked. Yeah. They would not say that they are you know overwhelmingly not prostitutes. They mm -hmm. they accuse the ones who weren't of being prostitutes so in order to make it fit the picture. <laughs> oh my God! I didn't realise he was in it. I'll tell you one other thing. I cut this out in early. I I, I offered this to a few people and developed it. And one of the things was, certainly, Ola Wally knew Jimmy Savile. And I put it in at the beginning, because where he danced at the Mecca Ballroom, that's where Jim mm. was the boss and uh, the DJ on Saturday night. 
and uh, they would certainly have known each other because they were both such remarkable figures in that scene. Um, and I put it in at first, and people said, uh, "We don't want to. We don't want to hear about Jim." No, it's just the so, right balance. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, we did a deal with Yorkshire Film Archive. They were really good about it. They gave us a deal for a few hundred pounds to to have all the archive and unlimited. And we had to actually the police archive. We had to get West Yorkshire Police to agree to it as well. So I wrote out what the film was about, and I sent it off. And thought, "Well, I'm never going to get this." And they. <laughs> And they said, yeah, sure, no problem, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Should we ask? Let's ask get Q&A, let's do it. What questions do we have? Yes. While the film is seated, looking at the documentary, um, there seemed to be a joke, sorry, with David Alawale's, um his time frame from getting here and getting a job and being seemed quite settled and they called him the Yankee I think he said um, and then suddenly there was this institutionalization and I, I just wondered there just seemed to be a fragment missing there that didn't uh, was there an actual breakdown was it something to do with uh, you know was it justified that he was institutionalized or was it to do with external factors I think there's there's very limited material on David Olawale. As I say, I grew up in Leeds, um, not knowing his story at all, and it's a very dramatic story. Because police threw a man in the river, killed him, and they were convicted of it. The police very rarely convicted of um, killings, especially uh, when it's black people, right? And um, so all, all, almost everything that we know about him comes from the trial, and trials are not investigative in a general sense. They provide evidence to defend and to attack, right? And that all, all, virtually all we know comes from the trial. And the witnesses are not particularly trustworthy. The police were made to give evidence in order to keep their jobs. And many of them were complicit in what had happened, right? So they, they gave accounts of them as a wild animal, yeah? And to sort of justify the fact that they'd been the driver to the woods and these other two guys attacked him. So it's very hard to get a clear picture of anything in his life. And, uh, but certainly it appears to be just that he was arrested and nobody knows why he was sectioned from that. Um, and the length of time he spent in Manston is extraordinary for somebody who yeah. it's the first time that they're going in. Um, and obviously those treatments that they gave people back then would destroy them mentally. Yeah. He was beaten to his head probably a hundred times or so on a hundred different occasions, 50 or a hundred maybe. So that would also, you know, make someone into a simpleton, you know, so eventually. So it's hard, it's hard to get a picture of any of it really clearly. Um, so I, I, I eliminated it. There's also very little evidence of, of the complicity of the police in it, so I, I ignored that, like trying to stitch up the entire Nick. They used to radio in and say where he was, right? And whoever wrote the W word in the charge sheet, that would have been somebody on the desk. So it wouldn't have been the two men who chased him night after night. That would have been somebody else. At the trial, they tried to establish who it was, and they said they couldn't. It's so unlikely that that's true, that they couldn't establish who was on the desk. They, they wrote the date down, right? So they know who was working. So there's only two or three people that could have written that down in a handwriting sample for quite simply just saying, look, it's one of you three until one of you admits it, you all lost your jobs. They didn't do anything like that. They just wanted two convictions. Now, I don't go after them in that sense. Because, I, you know, some of them will be alive and it would be a very dangerous game to, to defame people individually on flimsy evidence, as I said. So I just, I just pick on the two guys as the trial did. Unfortunately, I can't go more broad than that. There are some little gaps in it like that. Thank so. you very much. That's a pleasure. Can I just say, while well, I've got the microphone, the yeah. EDL, that, oh, that's so mad when it finished because, yeah, I get that three parter three nights a week. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Well, I suppose that was the point was we were just going to open. I knew that we couldn't answer any of the questions that we'd opened up. It's a short and so, oh, yeah. There's anyway. just so much there, yeah. yeah.
there is, there's lots to explore. And I'm kind of like, yeah, there was loads of things I thought, oh, I should have done that. <coughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I might get another chance. Plenty of time, yeah. You'll get another chance. Yeah, expand it and then we'll know. Yeah, next question. We've got a mic right coming around. Yeah? He's got a question. There's one at the back there. Uh, is it Pal? The um the, the boat? Paul. Paul. Um help me make the link with the Pascal quotes at the end and the, uh, and the and the journey there. What's what is your relationship with that? That's I'm I learned that through meditation, is that what you were going to, but you're also a scientist. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Um no, I mean I just when I was kind of looking at the idea I just came across that quote and um, there is no real kind of, um, I don't have a relationship to it, I was just kind of reading around the subject and it came up and I thought it kind of rang true that people were thinking that way back in the 1600s and nothing's changed. Um, and I thought, yeah, it's just quite relevant that like, the, that's why I kind of picked out the date because to see it's like 400 years later and we're still dealing with the same issues. So I thought it was quite poignant. Very relevant to say the madness, yeah. Question? I have. Um, it's quite interesting um, uh, that you say that they that after COVID people wanted to have fluffy. Mm. Thank you. That people want wanted to have fluffy commissions, mm. and yet you know what you've done in your um, in your short film um, mirrors. The, the Stephen Graham drama that's been out for this month. The yeah, that's walk-in. actually. <laughs> someone told me about that today. Uh, they said, "Oh, yeah, Stephen Graham's just done a drama, yeah. so that's probably put us, uh, messed up my features." To be honest. It might, <laughs> <laughs> you might need to oh well. Words. <laughs> commonality of ideas and all that. I don't think I'm going to be the only one doing a, a racism thing. Uh, no, Stephen Graham's was about somebody who's white and who is a member of it all and and uh, wanted to kill Rosie Cooper, whereas yours is, is about somebody who's mixed race and. Has been, it's a completely different well, that's kind of story. Well, hope for us. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I just think it's interesting that, you know, ooh, f- fluffs out the window, we've been through some very tough times and going through it now. Well, I think that's the important message is to just go and make whatever you want to make, really, and not try and read a market because it moves so quickly. And they're all crazy anyway, the people who do that kind of thing. And they look at things in a completely different way, you know, when you're trying to sell a film. And so I was going to go and do this kind of Shirley Valentine's thing in Lisbon, and uh, that didn't quite come off. And so we just went and made this short anyway. Uh, but you never know. I think that kind of like when you try to pitch films, it's always good to have two or three different things and spin a few plates because you never know which people would go for at a certain time. But um, yeah, if things align at the right time, then maybe yeah, uh, there might be a, a first for this kind of idea again. And I had some odd thing comments as well when we went for some funding. You know, was when we people had read the script and they were. Uh, was one person said that they didn't want to see the, the EDL humanized, and in, in a, and I was like, well, they're human. You know, <laughs> can't, how else are you going to portray them? You know what I mean? So, uh, and if you're going to go to them. Figure find out why people are, are racist, and you have to kind of explore that kind of thing. So it would be quite an interesting film to write. Thank you. I think a, uh, personally, I think it's quite important to keep pushing with these subjects. You know, you've done it, Jeremiah, with yours mm-hmm. on something from 1961, mm-hmm. and you know we should keep pushing it now as well. I think it's yeah, very important. Yeah. yeah, if you yeah if you got something to say, you know, just fresh to say about it. Yeah, I think you should always follow. Your heart. I think yeah, you know in the material. The Things swing this way and that way, but if you're making stuff that matters to you, you know, yeah. it, it's always going to play. Because when you see heart, you know it. You know, you feel it when you see it on the screen. I and definitely felt. It definitely felt. It was, it was undeniable, and it always is. I just, I think that's the way to go always. Yeah. Next question. Quite a lot. Oh, I'm we can always go. You can approach us individually. We're much more approachable now, you know. I promised everybody it's going to be a great networking event because uh, so many people coming who are in the business and so many of the filmmakers here, so we can all 
meet up and you've heard us all now, you know who we are. So you can come up and ask us anything you want. Okay? Yes. Thank you everybody for coming. Thanks to Salford University for providing this. Thanks to Kino for hosting such a good night. What's the name of the club again? Uh, the dockyard. It is literally out the front door across. There's, there's, you'll see the seats outside.